Which camp were you in, by the way, Gordon? I was in Lodz, I was in Auschwitz, and I was in Allen, Hanover. Allen. Allen. How does it spell? The A L L E N. A L A L A N. And then there's another one that was called Stecken. Also in Hanover. Did you have brothers or sisters? You were an only child. What kind of work did your father do? What kind of business was he? My in? father was in a, a, a upper shoe. Right. Upper, not the lower, but the upper shoe. Mm -hmm. Right here. Was it was it uh, with your family a religious family? Or, or? No, my direct, my mother and father were not religious, mm -hmm. but they're both families right? mm -hmm. were very orthodox. You mean the larger family? No, the, 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 their parents. Right, I understand they're right. Hasidish. Yes, my, my, my grandfather was, was a, a very known uh, Hasid. Yeah. yeah. So he. Uh, Poor guy did not know what to do, but he was telling us always that story with the kids. And he uh, went ahead and built a barrel. And as he built this barrel, his friends of Sneed says, Oh, yeah, you, you, you just to get a job, it's uh, you know, good work. Uh, could you make me one? So he made one and made two, and then he figured if he's going to make 50, it's going to be cheaper because he can buy more wood in it. So he made 50, so 25 to 50, the other 25, he had no more friends. And he was stuck with 25 barrels. So that the evening, you know, he was scratching his head in the mouth and took every single penny, right, and he invested in those barrels. Now what he's going to do? So he has seen a hole out there with a, with a wagon of, little, of, of pickles, of cucumbers. And he said, my God, you know, if I buy those cucumbers, I might be able to get a good buy. It was dark and he didn't sell them yet. I put them in these barrels. I might have built pickles. That's exactly what he did. He became the biggest uh, food wholesaler in life. I wondered, did you have any direct contact with uh, Chaim Rukowski? I was a kid. I figured, saying to myself, how much of an impression could you have of him? But surely you've thought about it and reflected what happened. A large number of the people I interviewed are from Lodge. I know that they say that Ronkowski was a terrible person. He played God. He decided later on he was killed. But on the other hand, when I go through this and I read the literature and everything else, you know, it seems to me that um, ultimately a lot of people from Lodge survived that the Rukowski was a single man, cared, he was a teacher, he cared about his people. He knew that the people would get killed. And he was trying to come up with a way, you know, how to exchange labor for food. And he did that. And then it was going along, <clears throat> he was told that he has to deliver so many thousands of people daily. And he figured that the longer he will delay it, right, the more of a chance we have to live. Mm -hmm. And he has accomplished that. There's no question that after a while he felt that he will be spared. He, 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 he's, he's the king, right? And he forgot himself that he's just a plain Jew. He paraded as a king. He had a job. Right. There are people which, which parade and people which know that they're in charge. But they still know they're as equal like everybody else. Uh, he took it a little bit one step further. So when he went to Auschwitz, right, uh, the way I was told, uh, he was very disappointed that he was just a plain Jew. I believe. As simple as that. <laughs> he didn't get any special treatment. That's right. And he was killed just like most of us did. Were you beaten during the war? A lot. In Auschwitz? A lot. You know, every time you know, I, went, I went to. to they would say there's some additional soup. So every time I went down to get some more soup, right, I got hit over the head with a, with a big wooden spoon. Eh? Why did I get hit? Because the, the guy which was serving the soup was a very nice German, right? And when the SS guy came in, right, he has to show how tough he is, right? Mm -hmm. So he seen the SS guy give him a over the head. <laughs> when you were in Auschwitz, what? What uh, part of the camp were you in? In Birkenau. In Birkenau. And how long did you stay there? Three, four weeks. You were in transit to some yes. other place? Where did you to go? Hanover. To where? To Hanover. 
to Hanover. In other words, did you come there in the last part of the war? I came there in 1944. Right as the war was ending? And in and, August. And then you were taken on a march or something? Yeah. No, I Where? From Auschwitz? From Auschwitz. No. You came from the Lodge Ghetto. You were among the last group to be evacuated from the Lodge Ghetto? Yes. Mm -hmm. From the Lodge Ghetto to Auschwitz. And been there 24 weeks. And then we went, 10,000 of us went to Hanover to a brand new camp. And we were there until April 10th of uh, 1945. And the amount of people which were there, of the 10,000, there was 120 left. From the 10,000, were the others were they killed immediately when they came to the camp? No, no, no. It was my my dad was with me, and he uh, got killed and died, or whatever you want to call it. He got a shot of the gasoline to his arm because he could not work anymore, and that's the way a lot of people got killed. But at the same time, uh, about the beginning of April, which was maybe the first days of April, uh, it was an hell. I understand a roll call. A roll call. And um, to ask the people which can walk, right? To go to the camp the left side and the one which cannot go to the right side. And I couldn't and I just decided that that's it and I gave up. So the people which went on the left on the left side were marched out from the camp and got killed on the way. Those were the ones who could work. Yeah. Could walk, yes. And we were in the camp, you know, which we couldn't. And we were digging our own grave, which we did not realize. We were told the date we were digging all the time. And uh, two days later, the, uh, the American Army. The American Army. You must have been totally emaciated at that point. I don't know. I, I really did not know. What you didn't even know. What was happening. How were you able, after the war, I mean, you had suffered tremendously, how were you able, after the war, to regain your, your strength and efforts? How, how were you able to find the strength to go on? Well, I, I, uh, maybe it was my youth. Uh, uh, I definitely, you know, for, for the first uh, three or six months, I think it was three months, I was in the hospital. Uh, but when I came out, uh, uh, I came out like a wild tiger. I just, I, 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 I just wanted to get back with everything that I lost. And I wanted to see everything. And I wanted to do everything. You know? And, and uh, amazing what happened to me is uh, when I was walking in the street in Germany, right? That was the first three, four months. And when a German walked on the same side, I had to ask him to go to the other side. I didn't want to walk on the same side of the street as a German. And uh, one day, I, uh, there was another group of guys, some of them were not Jewish. We, you know, we crossed the railroad track on the railroad station. Instead of going under the tunnel, the, the, in Switzerland and right. Germany, they had the tunnels. Right. I would have, or actually, I'd go down and just cross the tracks. This German policeman he got a hold of us and said, you dirty Poles and dirty Jews are still the same. We never want to obey laws. We always do against the law. And as he said that, right, we grabbed him and we took his head and we keep on hitting it on the track. You know? mm -hmm. And in short, I'll give you the story. In short, I was taken into a court. And uh, afterwards, I realized that the Jewish woman from the UNRWA, the hospital, the 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 Lieutenant, which I was, became very friendly with, an American said to me, Jack, tell him that uh, on the paragraph 1347, uh, you cannot, they cannot take you to a German jail because you're an ally. Hmm. So I said that. He said that the colonel would have looked at that up, he says, 100% right. As a Pole, he would be an ally. Yes. 
So uh, they put me in a jeep, and we went out for three days to look for a stockade for a jail, because all the jails were full with Americans. So they brought me back to the little town where I was, which was called Marburg, Germany. And uh, I went back to work in the same kitchen where I worked before. And uh, in, the, in the evening I was in the stockade. And there uh, I uh, met a priest, because there was no rabbi. And he opened my mind up, you know, that if you are going to be killing the same as they, they did to you. What's the difference with you, between you and them? And the way he said it to me, it just it totally changed my outlook. So you mean that, that until then, you mean you had real feelings of revenge? Yes. And that really changes. It's amazing how one sentence by a person, maybe it's because at certain points the mind is more receptive. Yes. And just change my whole it, way of thinking. What would you say the Holocaust taught you about human nature? What did it teach you about people? Uh, I didn't hear the television then. Uh, this, this Helen and I are married now for 42 years. Nice. And uh, I'll be 43. July 2nd, I'll be able to be 43. And um, we both have a different opinion about human nature. To me, I believe in the Eisenhower way. I, people are not guilty until you know, they have done something wrong. Uh, Helen looks at, you know, that certain people, she does not forgive them. German is just a German, and German is bad. And you're not, to a certain extent, uh, with me, then it means that you're against me. Uh, I believe if somebody is against me, right, it's to prove, right, to him, right, that he's wrong. And I'm prepared to debate it. Well, would you feel that way about an, an older German who was involved in the war? Even an older German requires to talk to to show how wrong he was. Not just take a pistol and kill him. We had animals. Well, the SS guards. They were, but we are not. And you think you can change them? That change. First of all, I don't, I don't want to go down to their level. See, that it's very important to me not to go down to their level. What did it teach you about human nature from the other side, in other words, of seeing how your own fellow Jews behaved during during the period, both in the ghetto and in the camps? Did you did you come away with any strong impressions about any particular things about how people react on distress? Most people are selfish, and you get the worst item, you know, on distress. It's very, very, very dangerous. And uh, I believe, again, education, right? knowledge, can help people a lot. In what way? That the people are not bad. There are good people everywhere. And there's only a very small percentage of bad people in the world, which we can definitely overcome. In a way, like we, like we as Jews, when we used to live, on one street, uh, uh, where your grandmother and your great grandmother and the rabbi and the baker and the butcher and everything else was in that one place, this was your world. And all of a sudden, when you went out of the world, like say, again, you were scared. Yeah. Being, uh, seeing the world the way I did after the war, uh, it gave me a total different perspective of, 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 of life. People, in when they get into the camp, and I've mentioned to you those people which were living in those in those individual streets, and when they have seen the guy which they did not know, right? He is not one of mine. And that this was the selfishness given to take care of only mine, not realizing, right? If we don't help 
each other, the whole group, right? That 5% cannot help itself, because we have to help the 100%. This idea, you know, of, of, of uh, communism, right? Mm -hmm. That there's only a few rich, right? That this would create communism at that time. It's the same thing on the stress. As a group, we can do much more than, a, than, than, than only a few. So we have to share. I found during stress, right? But a group of people like Russians, right? They were the best people to help. When they received a package of food, right? They shared it with the whole barrack. People are not bad. Others didn't. Because they were already used to sharing. They were forced to share in their lifestyle. Did your father try to inculcate these values in you as a child? Or your mother? My grandfather. This was he was this a strong... What, what Hasidic group did he belong to? You know? Garrett? Yes. After the war, I believe you came here in 1947? Yes. I came here in November 1947. Did you come by boat? Yes. Did you come from Bremenhaven? Yeah. What was the name of the boat? Swallow. The Swallow? Marine Swallow, right. That is a boat I have not heard of. I have heard of all the other Marines, but I haven't heard Swallow. of the Swallow. It landed in New York? Yes. It landed on 23rd Street. 23rd Street. Yes, I, was, I took a trip around New York on that pier tonight. So I, was, I was extremely disappointed when I arrived, when I got off the boat, you know, seeing this, this, the, the smell, the dirt, and everything else. I was prepared to wait till the boat returns and go back to Europe. Really? How come you didn't? But because I couldn't wait that long. I had no money in my pocket. I, had to, you know, I just went along with the crowd. Was someone there to greet you? The, the uh, highest. The, you came on a, a corporate affidavit, uh, on a highest affidavit? No, I, I, I had, uh, you know, I was fairly young when the war ended. Uh, I believe I was 16. 16. When the war ended, uh, 16 or something. Anyway, I, I got married in July 1947 in Hanover, Germany. And my wife uh, had family in Chicago and she actually received uh, papers to come to the, to the United States about a week after we were married. And uh, her mother uh, was alive at that time, and she had papers for her and her mother. So me being a young fellow, which nothing was impossible after the war, uh, I said, well, you go to the States and I meet you then. Uh, and you would come over? I didn't know, I didn't know how I'm gonna come. I just said, I'll meet you then, you go. Uh, so anyway, so the, I started to look back to another couple of years of school that I had. How much said, school did you have? Four years. Four years? Right. Total? Total. Because you were born in 29, 30? 29. 29. So you were 10 when the war broke out. You're from Lodge? Yes. So I, I, I uh, said that we have to go to the American the consul or embassy or whatever it is. I went to Frankfurt, Germany, right? And I went to the Council there, and I told him uh, that I would like to go to the States. How does a person go to the States? So, looking at me, he knew that I am a displaced person. And uh, he said to me, When would you like to go? I said, As soon as possible. He said, What about next week? It's pretty lucky. It's terrific. He said to me, uh, Well, we have here a representative of the, uh, the Jewish. Uh, in, joint it's called uh, or federation or whatever it is and, uh, and they will help you and i went over to this young to this lady and uh, she asked me how old are you right and i says how old do i have to be <laughs> <Good question. laughs> because documents we did not have right yeah. so i uh, made myself a year older yeah and uh, the following week uh, i had tickets and everything else uh, to go to Brandon and to leave. In the meantime, my wife did not leave with her mother because her mother had some problems with her eyes. Where, where was she from, your wife? From, from Poland. She lived in Lodz, but she was born in a town called Lagov. Uh, and uh, it's near Kelts. And uh, she actually arrived nine months after I did to the United States, and I brought her over. 
So I came to the States with, with just by accident. You know, I did not plan. So she was supposed to go ahead of you, and you right. actually wound up ahead of her. Right. How come you didn't have too much difficulty? I mean, the Polish quota was. Um, there was no. There was. There was no quota. Right. For people of a certain age, and from the concentration camps, there was no quota. I, you know, I, I'm one of those people which, which uh, I don't figure out what's, why I cannot go. I went there to figure out how I can go. And there was no difficulty. Some people waited in the DP camps for years. They didn't come till 51, 52. Yeah, I, I had no problems like that. Mm -hmm. And I arrived here and I, and I uh, joined the uh, IS picked me up. And I was in the uh, here at Astor Place on 8th Street in, in Manhattan. This was the building. Oh. Not the one on, um, on Lafayette? Yes, it's Astor Place. It's around the corner from right. Astor. Right. <laughs> you know, the address, the historical address yes, is Lafayette. 425 Lafayette. That's correct. Well, and you stayed there? Yes. And how long did you stay there? Three weeks. Three weeks. Right. You remember what it looked like? Yes. A dormitory-like yes. room? Yes. You were on the fourth floor? Mm -hmm. well, the third floor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I remember very well. I remember also that when I walked out, uh, from the building, uh, that's the reason I always remember Astor Place, right? Because mm -hmm. there's about eight different ways cars come through there, right? That's right. And I got hit by a car, right? Uh, because when I was crossing, and I got hit by a car, and, and uh, when I opened my eyes up, right, and I've seen all the people standing around me, I ran away. Because I figured I'm going to be arrested that I hit a car. That I hit a car. I am. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> How badly were you hurt? I mean, it was just, just a scrape, but I mean... It was nothing. I didn't break anything, but I was in pain. I was in bed for about a week. Either. So, but anyway, then, then I uh, looked back and, uh, and I found out who came before me. And, and uh, I found some friends on 10th Street in Avenue C. Uh, and I looked at my friends. And, uh, when I was... When I got up in the morning, right, and I went to the street and I smelled the herring and the pickles in the street, you know, and everything else, I said, this is America. You're on the Lower East Side. Right. I said, this is America, but I go back to, to, to Poland. And uh, I made up my mind and I joined the U.S. Army. You joined the U.S. Army? Right. Right after you got here? Yeah. Three months after I got here. There was no problem with not being a citizen or anything. There was, it wasn't the Korean War, it was 47. It was 48. 48. Right. It was January 48. And they took you? I filled up my papers, so you know, even had very little school in me. I could still write a little bit, and uh, no problems at all. Excuse me, most survivors that came here, either they were exhausted, or they had family, or they were looking for a job. To join the Army is quite a decision right after you come here. What well, 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 my decision was, uh, first, uh, I looked at New York and I did not believe that this is the United States. Uh, number two, uh, I did have a certain feeling that I have to return something, a part of my life, to the United States as they have liberated me. And number three, I wanted to learn what this United States is all about, and not to be only in New York, but we people from all over the United States. And I felt the Army will give me that. And fourth, by accident, I might be able to go back to Europe and bring my wife over and live with my wife. As a soldier? As a soldier, yeah. So those are the four different things why I uh, joined the Army. Your English was, I suppose, okay by then? Mm -hmm. Passable? Passable, maybe. maybe. I, uh, and I joined the Army and I was sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And I took basic training there for 16 weeks. And uh, after uh, I was finished with training, I got orders to go to Alaska. From Auschwitz to Alaska. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Which I was really not very happy uh, but, to go to Alaska because my wife was still in Europe. So this is the part which, which, which is interesting always to me. It's fascinating. Uh, I. Uh, decided to find a way how not to go to Alaska. And I uh, asked some people in the, the American Red Cross on the camp in the site. And surprisingly, that particular individual 
was a fellow like yourself. His parents were from Poland and he was born in the United States. And this is uh, Jack. I, uh, maybe I can help you. I have some friends in the uh, general's office and maybe they can help me. And I took his advice and uh, I wound up uh, meeting here. I thought about him with uh, Gerald Smith, Vidal Smith. You ever heard that name? Yes, I have. It's W. Bedell Smith. And he was the commanding general of the First Army in Governor's Island there in New York. And when I came, he had my file, and, and uh, he himself was a liberator of camps. And so he says, what would you like to have? He was very sympathetic. Yeah. Right. And I told him about my wife, and uh, he said, okay, let's cut orders and send you to Europe. And uh, they sent me from four things to a place called Kent Kilmer, which is New Brunswick, New Jersey. And uh, I went there, uh, and as I'm ready to be shipped out, my dear wife sent me a telegram that she's in a boat coming to the States. So she knew you were you were going there, and she was coming here. Right, and I was going to wait for me. I figured, I figured that other you might have be, be able to a good time, and I'm the army, and everything. There's no way of my staying here one day. And which you without you. Yeah, I'm coming. So I went back to the same general. There were no problems. He changed orders again. And they gave me a uh, a job in Governor's Island. And uh, Helen, when I was living in, outside of, of the Army, I was living in Manhattan. I was living on 2nd Street, the first day I could be with her. And the Army was yet on the stand. That's terrific. Yeah. So your impression, your impression of America was not that great, but your impression of the army was so when, when I left the east side, right, right. I found that America is not New York. And what did you do afterwards? When, uh, you, you, how long did you stay in the army? Well, I was in the army uh, altogether three years and seven months. Uh, yeah, but uh, the three years and seven months was two terms, because... Uh, when I was in the army, I, uh, when I was living here in Manhattan, I uh, started to uh, repair typewriters for the army. And I was sent to a school uh, how to be able to repair office equipment. And, uh, and that's the reason, the reason why I wound up in Manhattan. When I came out from the army in 1950, I went into business. I borrowed money from every town they and Harry I could and to open up a office equipment business. Well, six months later, I got a letter from uh, our leader, Eisenhower, to return to the Army because of the Korean War. See, and I, had to, I couldn't sell my business. I had to close it, and I owed all this money. Well, this was another education for the America. <laughs> <laughs> Something. So what did you do? Nothing. You just went. Uh, what could you do? But I uh, did not go to Korea. And uh, I still stayed in New York. I still did the same jobs I did before. The same general was helpful to you? No, there was no more general. But you already were doing this for a while. As far as the officer was concerned. And anyway, I continued doing the same thing. And, and uh, in 1952 or something, I was then uh, discharged from the army, totally, and uh, I went back to the same business. And that's the way I started my office equipment business. And the business it grew or continued to grow? Or? Yeah, with, with what I did, you know, again, I, I started up with, with repairing typewriters, selling typewriters. Uh, I get a GI bill. I get the GI loan uh, for the price of twenty-five thousand dollars. Right. And I moved from the Bronx uh, to a place called Toronto, Canada. Mm -hmm. Where were you living in the Bronx? No, I didn't live in the Bronx. I lived in one hundred seven East Second Street. I see. You worked. The place was the in the store Bronx. Store was on Fordham Boulevard. Do you know the Bronx? Fordham Road, near Grand Concourse, maybe, or east? No, it was right across from the University next to the White Castle. 
Yes, I know where that is. It's down the hill. Yeah, there's no more White Castle. Now. I know, but I remember when there was. There's Fordham right. Universities right. there. Right. 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 Uh, yeah, in my youth, I used to shoot no. pool there. I remember the place. Right. So I remember was, the White this, Castle. Yeah, there was, there was a typewriter that's going to call Sylvia Typewriter. This was that one. That's what you want. Right. And when you say the business moved to Toronto, did that mean you moved to Toronto also? I moved to Toronto what, also. What year did you move there? In 1955. Mm -hmm. And how long did you live in Canada? Oh, I lived in Canada from 1955 until 1960. No, until 1962. And then I uh, went back to New York and I opened up a business again in New York. Because what happened is that I moved to Toronto with the idea, not the only idea, I got a distributorship for all of Canada. I couldn't get it in the States. I got there was somebody going in the Bronx was a typewriter. And the typewriter was called Everest. And I uh, got this agency for Canada, so I moved to Canada. Between Canada and uh, and the United States, do, do you see any any differences in living in these two countries from the perspective of a survivor? Very Very good. When I came to to, uh, to the border in 1955, when I was asked uh, what I'm going to do in, in Canada, what I'm going for, just to live there. He just wrote a lot of these papers, and I'm about to live out in the mood. <laughs> the help of people like yourself, I'm trying to gain an understanding of what those qualities are that help. The quality that, to me, the, the point that you just bring up, you know, I was just searching in my mind, today, right, I would not do what I've done 35 years ago. 35 years ago, nothing was impossible to me. There was nothing for me to lose. I could only gain, so I could take chances. People which, which are set in their life, they have family, right? They're always afraid of taking a risk. I had to take risks. I had nothing. Right? So when I was asked by a company called Sears Robot, right, in Canada, to assemble a typewriter for them, right, and I asked them, would you lend me the money to do that? They said yes. So I came back and told them I need $176,000, right, and they gave it to me. I searched my every, because I, I, I didn't know how to assemble typewriters. So, so I went to Royal, I went to Underwood, I went to Smith Corona. They all, all left it because they have their own branches in Canada. I wound up in Prague, Czechoslovakia. And I got a license from Czechoslovakia to build typewriters. They gave me a crew of engineers, right? We started, they, they set up an assembly line for me. You know, and uh, we became successful. That's where we got into production by taking a chance by not giving up, searching till you succeed. Well, it seems to me then that in addition to God helping you, you, you also helped yourself. Well, God always does that. He always gives you opportunities, right? But you, but you have to take them. <laughs> it's true. And I went in 1962, 62. I kept the business in Canada and I moved back to the United States. And then in 1960, Six, I believe, I moved back to Toronto again. And then in 1969, I moved to California. Where? To uh, a pardon me? place called Sa Santa Clara. Sure. Uh, I don't know, but none of those places, right, did I give up. So it means I, wherever I started, I had a business there, the business continued, right, and I just kept expanding. It's a very interesting question that you just raised now, but my, my father lived in Germany, he's one of those osteo, you know, left Poland, lived in Germany for a while, but he's an older man, he's 80, and, um, and he always said that, you know, that, that the German Jews tried to assimilate and, and tried, and, and didn't just look in their own corner, in fact, they sought out friendships with Christians, didn't do them any good. There is this the, fine, the very fine line, right? To be able to be with Christians, right, and still be a good Jew, to respect each other, not to hide who you are. German Jews told me, I bought a factory in Germany in 1962, 
and the fellow, right? The, which introduced me to his father-in-law, which was not Jewish, right? Of us, Jews, right? To buy the factory from him. to be Jack, one thing you should not, what you should not do is tell What you shouldn't do is tell him that you were Jewish. Because, you know, you're going to have 2,000 German employees. Don't tell him you're Jewish because you will not get the loyalty from me. So what did I do? So I took, I took it over. You told him you were Jewish? I had a speech to all them. I told them not only Jews, that I was I'm a survivor of a concentration camp. I told them anybody which was in the SS. I want him in my office in the next two days, in these hours. And I had over 20 people come. And about six of them walked out. They said they will never work for a Jew. And the other 14? The, the other were, were as they apologized. It wasn't their fault and all that. I have a... a <laughs> well, wait a minute. They didn't have to, right? They didn't have to. I mean, they didn't have to come to your office. You would never have known who was an asset. Correct. Correct. So those 14, you didn't see it as chutzpah, you saw it as honesty? I see it as honesty, and I've seen that they were looking for, for forgiveness. And you gave it to them? Yes. You were in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. and you call an SS officers, I mean, that's a, um, that's a rather large capacity for forgiveness, I would say. But it's so much better to be able to forgive than to hate. The other what do you gain with it? You don't get anything. It's your personal, it's your personal <laughs> ego that gains it. You don't really gain it. I don't believe in ego. Correct. Yeah, I, I thanks God that I'm doing very well. Money is not an important factor to me. It's accomplishment, which is important. I believe that uh, the separation of church and state is very important. And the same thing is in business. Friendship and business are two separate things. Private life and business are two separate things. When you are a officer of a public corporation, you are presenting other people's money. You are a trustee. And you have to fight for the last drop. You own money. You're entitled to do whatever you want. And with your own time, you're entitled to do whatever you want. So two separate things. It's difficult when you're in business with a friend, too. Because it's hard to separate yeah. the two. Well, to me, if, you, if I'm business with a friend, like, this friend does not understand, right? That friendship and business are two separate things. He's my friend. But he's very narrow-minded. I'm just thinking, people have told me sometimes, don't go into business with a friend. Because if you go into business with a friend and the business doesn't go well, you're going to be out the friend also. But I, I, I declare myself ahead of time with friends and with others who I am. I prepare to be divorced before I start. In other words, you're going to do it strictly on the merits. Slowly. Slowly. Mm -hmm. if, if it's family or everybody. Now, you demand a lot of people in work, but you pay them well for it. Yes. In other words, if but they do their job, you know, you do demand. You want them to be on duty, you want them to be there, you want them to do what they're supposed I tell people, when you come in to work for me, right, and you're going to work on a reasonable salary, right, I'm there to help you teach you whatever it is. If you will demand a high salary, right, mm -hmm. I will demand a lot from you. If you don't perform, your ass is out. Mm -hmm. So one way or the other. If you tell me that you're capable of doing it, then do it. If you want to come in as a student and learn, right, well, I will do that. You will not get fired. Is there any way in which your experiences during the war uh, help shape your attitudes and how you do things and what you believe in and the principles that you hold? It must have been, like I think I mentioned to you, the principle, the most important thing, whatever you do, right, it has to in some form or some way to help people in help society, which is the same thing. So you have to be upfront with people, right? You should never try to say how wonderful a person is, right, if he isn't. If I fire someone, right, and then when the same person tells somebody to, to get a reference from him, right? I will not tell the guy which calls me that this guy was wonderful. I will tell him he was fired. Because we have to tell the society the truth. Yeah. You, you would want to know if another person from another company... But, but, but most people don't do that because they want to... Why should it be me? That's all it was bad. I, would, I, I am I'm, uh, conservative. Uh, I'm 
definitely not uh, reformed and not orthodox. But, what is it but uh, I do believe in helping Jews. You've accomplished so much that, that which means that there isn't another all kinds of Jews. Do you, do you believe God, in a sense, did watch over you? That you wouldn't be here today if not for that? That was when you said, ask him. I believe uh, uh, that there isn't somebody above me. And I believe there's somebody which does control this computer, right? And I believe that we are only little flies, right? That he actually sees me as this little fly. I do not know. Once in a while or something especially will see me. But I don't I don't think that I'm that important that he watches me. You've already proven so much. No, for me it was very, very simple. I came to the United States uh, not knowing anything in no one, right? And I had to prove to myself that I'm equal with other people. That I can accomplish it. There was a, a drive within. In the same time, I had goals. That anything that I will do, right, has to help society. It's not just to accumulate money. But my hard work has to also accomplish something. Because to me, to try to avoid what happened in the Second World War, right, we have to live with people, with all kinds of people. And wherever there is a problem of human rights, of people being discriminated in any kind, it's for us to go out there and help. Not only Jews. Do you get involved with other types of... Uh, Very much. The Lama is being discriminated in China. And Tom and I went to China. But I just mentioned the Dalai Lama. In the same time, I went there for business, right? Tom went there for the, for the human rights. Right. And we had an opportunity to meet in the United States Embassy, right? With the foreign minister of China. With 10 human rights activists, right? Which was took it took some time to get this organized. Excuse me, what year was that? A year before, two years ago. Two years ago. Right. So, uh, and at the same time, we had to bring in the, the Yiddish kite, right? So, lessons, Passover, right? We had 45 students uh, from Tenement Square, right? Which we had a Seder, in which we translate the Haggadah into Mandarin. In order to explain to them the whole concept of freedom, the right, the growth, <laughs> which, which was unbelievable to them, yeah. that here is a race of people which for five, six thousand years we already struggling with freedom, and to them this was something like you know they thought that they're the only ones suffering. So yes, uh, we are very, very, I very much believe in that. So the drive, what you asked me before, was to be able to accomplish those kind of things. So when it comes to computers, where I can say, I felt that it was the most important thing to be able to manufacture a computer which every kid in the world will be able to afford to buy. And before I had done this, right, the IBMs, the DEX, etc., right, believed that computers are only for privileged people, which means that if you don't have $100,000, you couldn't buy it. You see, because the cost of producing a computer, there's a thing as home computers, right, and computers. They're both the same, but one costs $10,000 and one costs $1,000. Or we even sold them for $200. So nothing to do with the cost, it has to do, you know. So so I, I uh, sold uh, this computer uh, worldwide, much more in the world than in the United States. And one of my best market is Germany where I had the opportunity right, to meet with German youth, with uh, computer clubs. And there wasn't a time when I met people in these clubs, and when I was interviewed in Germany, that the word concentration camp wouldn't come up. That means who I am, right? Uh, why I have done what I have done, right? and why I want to help youth. Right? Why I want to develop the brain and to give as much information as possible, right? 
uh, that this should not happen again. What was the reaction of the Germans when you talked to them this way, when you brought this up? Oh, they, they, they were very, very much interested. They wanted to know more about me. They wanted to know more about my background. They wanted to know more, like, again, why I'm in Germany, you know, and, 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 uh, why I'm doing this. And you know, my end always was to prove to you, right, that I'm as equal as you are, that the Jews do not have horns. Information is good. If you allow an individual, right, to face the computer himself, right? And he does not have to be afraid if the commissar is in the back of him, right? Of the mother which wants only to deal with blonde kids. He can actually exchange, right, information, right? With the computer himself. And nobody will laugh at him, right? Nobody will criticize him, right? He will be able to go over a hundred times on the same subject, right? Till he finds the right answer. And that's something which a teacher cannot do. And that's the reason why it's so important. They can do a lot of good. Uh, you know, I sold my interest in Commodore in 1984. And I took over a company called Atari. In the same time, right? In the same place in Germany, right? I was successful there again with the new company. As I was with the old company because the people followed me. Not as much in the United States, none. But in places like Germany. None in the United States? No, yeah, there's nothing, none. I mean, I'm, in the United States, we do not sell very much. Our sales, mm -hmm. we do about the half a billion dollars in sales. Uh, in, from the half a billion dollars, about 425 million is overseas. In Europe? Yes. Well, we, we sell some. Asia, too? Some. Do you plan to? to be selling more in the United States? I plan, but it's not easy. Because in the United States, the people, the thinking of an American is totally different than a, than a European. How is it different on this matter? Well, a, a, an American does not buy a computer because he tested all the computers. He buys a computer because uh, Professor Schleimer uh, Rosenberg, which is a specialist from from Colombia says that this company is a good machine. I don't know if you've never told me you We don't do things here because we test ourselves. But you don't do it empirically here. You just, we just follow the crowd. <laughs> but then again, uh, I know that you put in, uh, I read in an interview that you gave, I don't remember if it was Business Week or The Economist or whichever journal it was, that, that you said that you planned maybe to have a $10 million advertising campaign in America, oh, we do. because that's the way Americans think. Oh, we do, we do. But it's still, we do advertise in Europe too, but not on the same basis. What I'm saying to you here, it's very tough. Of course, I understand it's, it, but it's you've done- because of those kind of thinking. But you've done wonders. You, you took Atari Public in a few years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, not, as you can see, I'm never satisfied. I can do much better. That's what I want to know. What keeps you going? <laughs> No. You've already done so much. Of that. No, I, I really have now slowed down tremendously as far as business is concerned. In what sense? I have three sons uh, which work in the company. Uh, I'm the chairman of the company. My oldest son is the chief executive officer. That's Sam? President, right? And really, he runs the business. Mm -hmm. I am not involved from day to day in the business. I'm there like a database. Uh, which they call me in wherever I am, you know, which they now, I'll, now I'll take my question the other way, okay. since you're only 60, right? right? 60, 62. 62. I don't know if you'd never told me if you took the older year and gave it back when you came here. Uh -huh. What did you do? Did you, did you stay at that age? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get Social Security earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, the relationship of Tom an exception? Or no, I, I, I uh, for the first 25 years of business, right? I had very little relation with with friends. I was so busy building, right? Uh, that uh, I was never home. Uh, in this taught me, right? That Jews from Hungary or from Germany or from Argentina, right? We are all the same. All the same and non-Jews are some wonderful people. So we have created a, 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 a friendship, right, all over the world with, you know, people, which we don't go by, they, they came from Lodge, they came from Krakow, or they came from uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, 
Can you tell me just a little bit about your children? You, you have three sons. Sam is the oldest. Yeah. My, my three sons are, uh, are married. Yes. My, my, my oldest son was... Uh, I he was in charge of um, at Hari. He uh, had an opportunity to spend uh, 10 years before working for Commodore all over the world. And uh, he really got a total international flavor of what the world was about. His kids, one was born in England, one was born in Tokyo, and one was born in Hong Kong. His three children. His three children. Where's his wife from? Well, he has a, uh, a sad uh, story. His oldest daughter, his mother, uh, was a, he, he had married in Toronto from uh, high school. Uh, uh, they met in high school and they fell in love, but she converted to Judaism. Uh, she taught us more about Judaism, the family, uh, than anybody else. The day of 26, she passed away of cancer. And when she passed away, she told Sam, please marry an Orthodox Jewish so she can bring up Sarah Orthodox. So Sam did that. He's married to a young lady, which is, it's, her name is Tippy, and she did come from Montreal, Canada. And she's Orthodox. And she's Orthodox. Uh, Sarah, this was, last year was the first year in high school. Till then she was going to a Hebrew school. Uh, who, who, who was going to a Hebrew school? Sarah, my granddaughter. She graduated. Uh, uh, she went to the age of uh, 15, 14. No, I don't understand. But where? In what city? Yeah. In, uh, San Jose. In San Jose. In Sunnydale. Mm -hmm. So this is the the, uh, the uh, oldest, uh, the youngest one, uh, the middle one. His name is Leonard. He uh, was always, uh, from the age of four, he always looked into the stars. He always loved uh, astronomy. And uh, he became a... Uh, Doctor of uh, Physics of Astronomy. He graduated from Columbia. Uh, and he is uh, the guy in charge of our software in the company. So he's a businessman too? I mean, he's, he's more in the, in the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's married? That's true. He's married. He married a, a young lady from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. and also went to school in Columbia. Her name is Priva, and they have uh, one son, and they're just expecting another child in the month of July, around the 9th of July. Thank you. And then the youngest one uh, is, uh, his name is uh, Gary. Uh, he was uh, born in Toronto, and uh, he already seen a good life. Uh, he never, he was in, in California, very, very seldom that he leave California. And, uh, he is uh, mostly in charge of operation administration. He's married, just had a baby. Uh, his wife's now had a, so all three of them have different functions in the company. All Jewish, all this world. Yeah. In the middle of the paper that uh, all of the Chinese are doing wonderful, they work very hard, the immigrants, the immigrants, the immigrants. The truth is that it's usually the second generation that does better. That survivors should be doing almost as well as American Joes is a tremendous achievement. Well, I, I disagree with you. Uh, you go back historically. I believe that the first generation today is doing better right, than the second. Which first generation? I mean, uh, of other groups? Or? Of oh, immigrants. That means the, the, the people which are immigrants which come, right? They come now, right, after the Second World War with different the values, you know, the, the, the Americans are, in general, lazy people. When an immigrant comes here, right, this is paradise because there's so many openings to be able to make money. Mm -hmm. For some reason, when you come out from Colombia, you don't see the same things because you're only looking, you know, in New York right. Square. That's right. That's true.
in that immigrant sees a lot. So if he is willing to work, right, there's no limit how much money he can make. Because he can be you know, selling fruit, or he can be a tailor, and he can do six jobs in the same day. So all the way they're doing well is because they work their ass off. Well, my feeling is that if they're doing as well as American Jews, they're really doing better because it means that they came here from another country with nothing. For them to have to do it, to function at the same level as a person who's been here for three generations means that they're doing but better. They're doing better because they work harder. That's right. That means that we have to just look at the thing, as that's the way it's done. You always have to find some a room for something new, for something where you fit. And you have to make that mold, right, what you believe in. Not just to follow somebody else in the world. That's the only way we can grow in this world. And lately, in the United States, we believe in molds. This is it. It seems to me that's something you're born with. It seems to me that that's something you, you I mean, I don't know, you develop it if you have it, but you have to have the basic material to develop it. Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I believe that necessity is the mother of invention. If I would have had a lot of education, if I would have been a professor of something, right? I would only want to be in that. Or if I would have been a plumber, right? Uh, or uh, earning my $200, I would not look out you know, how to assemble type rails. I had no education. I had nothing. I had to reach out. I was forced to reach out. Do you think that the majority of people who are forced to reach out make it work? If they are reaching out, the majority will make it but there's very few which will reach out. They're afraid to reach out. But they're, they're in, afraid they're going to fail. But when they're in positions like yours, which all the survivors were in when they came here, they didn't have anything. There was nothing to lose. So that greater proportion yes. made it. Yes. In other words, it's your position mm -hmm. in life yes. that really determines yes. what's going to happen yes. to you. Yes. The, the, the only thing which, which is uh, from everything bad, right, comes out also good. Now, the, the Holocaust was something extremely bad. But now it's our responsibility to make sure to tell the world, right, what happened.